from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming right up, K-State's Tim Dalton visits with Sarah Moyer about the findings of a new UN report on global food security and nutrition. He'll talk about the three principal factors contributing to food availability concerns around the world and about how the Feed the Future Innovation Laboratories at K-State are contributing to the response to these food security challenges. Also, today's report from the 2017 National FFA Convention in Indianapolis from Kansas FFA State Reporter Riley Schlichter. And for this week's K-State Horticulture segment later on, Ward Upham advises you vegetable gardeners about harvesting those last tomatoes and peppers of the season. All that here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer. Here to discuss the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report. It was an annual publication that was released earlier this month, and the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, more commonly known as FAO, and other supporting organizations published this for the public, for researchers and people in this area. And here alongside us to help interpret the messages within this large report, we have K-State Agricultural Economist and Director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Collaborative Research on Sorghum and Millet. Tim Dalton, good to have you along. Thank you, Sarah. Great to be here. And there's a lot contained within this report, and we'll circle back to discuss K-State's role. And as far as the messages go that are within this report, what are some of the top priority ones that you interpreted? Great, Sarah. That's a good question. So Every year, about the middle of um, October, the FAO releases their annual report on the state of food insecurity in the world. So it's an annual update on the trends and what are some of the major issues that are affecting food insecurity and hunger around the world. And so that occurred just last Monday on the 16th of October, and that coincided with the World Food Day. So I guess I was a little bit surprised by the message. I thought that there was a lot of positive trends in where we were moving in reducing hunger and and food insecurity around the world. But the key message that was put out was that the numbers increased from uh, approximately 777 million in, in the previous year up to about 815 million people around the world that are affected by food insecurity. So that's about 11% of the global population. And and while that number is trending in the wrong direction, it's also good to note that a decade ago, we were well over a billion people, 1.1 billion people. So there is long-term trends in the progress, and this is an uptick, a blip in the world. And And so the key messages that came out of the report is that there's really three driving factors that are affecting these numbers. And despite the fact that commodity prices have been low, and that should be good for food consumers being able to to afford more food, it just didn't play out that way. I thought that was going to dominate the issue. But there's really three major issues that are affecting global food insecurity right now. There's just general economic slowdown around the world. We're in a booming economy here in the U.S., but around the world, it's a little bit less of a story. So fewer people are getting wealthier. And they're increasing their incomes at a slower rate. So that's affecting how much food they can buy. Commodity prices across the globe are low. And so nations which are exporting oil and other commodities to the global markets are not earning as much money. And that doesn't provide enough cash so they can go out and buy 
food commodities for their populations at the same rate as they had in the past. So that's the second issue. But the, really the third main issue, which is a really difficult one for us to get our hands around in the field of agriculture, is that there's been an uptick in a lot of localized insecurity around the world. And so these are not border wars between nations. These are non-governmental or what we call non-state insurgencies that are taking place in places like South Sudan, in Nigeria with Boko Haram in the northeastern part of the country, in Somalia, Al-Shabaab, Yemen, we hear about the insurgency there, of course, in Syria, which is on the news, and, and that which spilled over to Iraq. So these are really some of the major forces and kind of the maddening part about this last human-induced issue of food insecurity is that it's estimated that about 489 million out of the 817 million that are food insecure live in these areas. And what's even worse about it is that of those that are under five, those that are severely malnourished, uh, children that are stunted, the 122 million, about 75% of them are located in these conflict areas. So that's the human-induced side of food insecurity that is very difficult for us to look at. And I think we're much more attuned to drought and insects and too much rain but, uh, you know, humans are difficult animals to deal with. And trying to perceive what to do moving forward. Of course, there are some goals set by the FAO and partnering organizations that have set some benchmarks for where to go moving forward. Of course, the trends with human interaction and some of those conflicts are harder to calculate in as agriculturalists try to make progress. But where do you see some of the effects that have been going on in agriculture or the progress? How are those influencing some of these numbers? So good question, too. I think I'm going to break it back and just kind of, even though that last point was kind of a little bit not the most optimistic situation, I just wanted to kind of tie it off with a good example of where once peace has been restored, how things can change really dramatically. So back in the 90s and 2000s there in Uganda, in northern Uganda, there was a rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army, which created a lot of havoc throughout the whole northern part of the country. Agriculture just was not going anywhere. Crops were stolen and livestock were stolen. Uh, populations were displaced from one region to another. So you just couldn't settle down into agriculture. And the entire population was dependent upon food relief to survive. And that situation has cleared up. That band of uh, rebels has been pushed back into oblivion or pretty close to it. And at this point in time, there is no need for food relief. So in the past 10 years, stability has emerged and has stabilized the region. And now that they are completely free of any need for food relief and food aid. So the key thing is is that just that stability is really critical for pushing those numbers down. And so if we could think about a sort of an optimistic world where these conflicts didn't exist, well, you can imagine that a good chunk of that 489 million people could emerge out of that food insecure situation. I guess there's a couple of messages. One, in those types of world, it's the, the U.S. plays an important role in terms of how we interact with nations and, and international organizations in trying to establish peace. So peace is a big piece of this. I'm sorry about the pun on words, but it's really critical. And so the role that we play in international affairs is just an important element in global food security. And then secondly, there's still a chunk of individuals out there who are living in the very dry areas of the world. So they're living in the western Kansases of the world and even drier areas into the rangelands of the further west without irrigation that rely upon crops which are heat and drought tolerant. We think about South Asia where there's even, because of El Nino and La Nina effects, there's too much rainfall. And so we are looking for rice crops that are submergent tolerant, that can overcome being flooded up, you know, above the, the tops of their, their shoots and still, as that water recedes, survive and grow. So there's an incredible scientific effort that needs to be invested in, one, improving crop yields, but secondly, becoming more resistant to heat and drought, to then submergence, and then there is a whole series of pests which are important, insect pests and weed pests. So reducing the damage associated with those pests in general is an important topic that we can work on. And the key message there is that we share a lot of the same needs and research here that the rest of the world needs as well to face some of those challenges. 
many complexities going on, but breaking that down, it does make it seem a little more achievable. Some of those agronomic practices that you mentioned, those types of improvements, how do they show that the economics behind those can become more stable or less of a downturn as we've seen in the past year that you mentioned? Yeah, well, there's a lot of different elements to food security. One is local availability. Producing enough on your own is really the front line to food security that allows surpluses to be marketed in local communities, and that keeps prices low. So a lot of times there's food insecurity. Food's available, but it's very expensive. And when you're spending 75% of your income on food, once that price doubles or even it gets 50% more expensive, you just don't have enough money to have enough food. So the front line is local food availability and producing enough for yourself and having sufficient amounts to market so that your neighbors can afford food locally. So a lot of the agronomic practices that we're looking at in terms of you know, wheat being more heat tolerant and drought tolerant so that we can stabilize and improve yields in western Kansas are the same issues they're facing in India and Pakistan and the Punjab. And the same thing with milo production in western Kansas with drought and, uh, and heat affecting yields there. That's the same issue we're facing in the in the sub-Saharan countries of, of Senegal, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, into Ethiopia, where those are the number one food crops for a lot of these populations. So really three areas, two commodities, one systems, and then one post-harvest lab. Kansas State has four of these labs. There's 24 across the United States. The only other university in the U.S. is the University of California, Davis, which has five of these labs. So we're very proud to see in the past five years that we've come on so strongly and we've netted more than any other uh, university in the United States. And our profile is being very highly elevated in this area that we're working holistically across commodities as well as across systems and, and storage, reducing storage losses. We're going to take a short break, but when we do come back, Tim and I will discuss K-State's role in moving the needle and, as you've been alluding to, how some of these projects overseas or in these countries struggling with issues related to food security can reap some benefits for the producers back here in the states and in Kansas. Once again, this is K-State agricultural economist Tim Dalton with us talking about the state of food security and nutrition in the world. The report was released just a couple weeks ago earlier this month, and we'll be back here on Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day -day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer, once again here with K-State Agricultural Economist Tim Dalton. He is also the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Collaborative Research on sorghum and millet. Those two crops are ones that have been originating back into some of these areas that we've been discussing, some of these areas that have food security issues going on and local availability, as you were mentioning, is a key part of that. But what does some of the research that's being done through K-State and other partners over in some of those areas do for producers back here in Kansas? Okay, great question, Sarah. So let me just kind of start out with a kind of a bigger picture overview. The program that I work on, the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Collaborative Research on Sorghum and Millet, is funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development. There's a number of those working on other commodities. One works on horticulture, peanuts, soybeans, uh, wheat, and then uh, dry beans and pigeon peas and other types of crops like that, in addition to some of the systems ones on sustainable intensification and, and otherwise. But these programs were created back in the 1970s, and it was the primary vehicle that the U.S. had to work collaboratively 
with scientists at the equivalent of the USDA in foreign countries working with collaborators at universities or other laboratories to improve local food security. And so I work on one which is focusing on sorghum and millet uh, production. And so we work with, um, collaborate with individuals at the Ethiopian Institute for Agriculture Research, the equivalent of the USDA, Haramaya University, which was established back in the 1950s by Oklahoma State University, uh, Hawassa University. And the idea is that we link U.S. researchers in either the USDA or in universities with equivalents in those countries to focus on issues of, of common interest. Uh, we do the same in Niger. We do the same in Senegal. Those are our three focus countries. We've added some work in Haiti just this past year uh, where the sugarcane aphid is an incredible problem down there. And so all of these provide us with an opportunity to tap into some of the best and the brightest researchers around the world. And remember, you know, sorghum isn't, or Milo was not uh, grown in the United States to begin with. It started out and its origin is in uh, eastern Sudan and Ethiopia region. So many crops are not from the United States. And so we need this collaborative work in order to, to help us out as a you know, base thing to get the seeds. And, and some of the original work was about collecting varieties and, and seeds in uh, back in the 70s and 80s. But more generally, the strategy is that we just don't want to continue being a supplier of food aid and food relief. And so by building stronger research networks around the world, those institutions then are able to work on these problems for themselves and target that research so it's more relevant for their populations at hand. And so in one, it's just building this capacity that's very, very important. Uh, but secondly, for example, in, in, in the sorghum community, research community, it's very small. So having these networks are very important. And the great example is in Haiti. Haiti's got three sorghum growing seasons per year. They get attacked by sugarcane aphid three times a year. And so if we can begin to work with the Haitians to attack this problem there, it's going to create two more opportunities per year to look at the impact of this pest on sorghum and identify varieties which are resistant. So there's a clear opportunity for, for us to, to not only contribute to solutions that are locally relevant in our host countries, but also we learn something in return. Of course, the sorghum and millet perspective is one that you're most familiar with. Could you speak for others that are also working overseas through K-State and working on some of these projects, maybe with wheat, for example, since that's one that K-State also has an emphasis on? Right. So Dr. Jesse Poland is leading the the Wheat Innovation Lab. It's called the Climate Resilient uh, Wheat um, Innovation Lab. And he is working with some of the best researchers in the world in northern India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, which is really the breadbasket of a good percentage of the world's population, of the Asian population. And there it's just more and more of the same story, more heat, more drought. And so he is working with collaborators there, which again provides more opportunities to test materials and look at strategies and understand how wheat responds to heat and drought stress and to take that information and adapt varieties in those conditions so that they are more resistant to those, but at the same time learn more about what are the underlying processes, the physiology, so that he can bring that knowledge back to the U.S. and work with it with the knowledge that he's gained in adapting uh, varieties for western Kansas and and, uh, broader areas. So that's one good example about where Kansas State is a global leader in wheat. There's no question about that. And so we might as well take advantage of our leadership in order to and and work on these problems around the world. Uh, The third lab that we have is the Sustainable Intensification Lab. And so, again, this is one which is really focusing on cropping systems, better rotations, better soil management, looking at issues of of tighter integration of crops with livestock to close those those cycles and those loops so we take best advantage of the, the inputs that each provides and to maximize the outputs looking at how that can be used to improve local nutritional status. So one thing we talked about, as Sarah earlier, was the global numbers of food insecure, but there's a lot of individuals who may not, on the outside, look 
hungry, but they're lacking micronutrients, uh, vitamin A, uh, iron, zinc, uh, which can be increased by eating a more diverse diet. So the Sustainable Intensification Lab works on improved nutritional issues through these highly integrated cropping systems. And again, Kansas State uh, is a leader there because Kansas is an extremely diverse state from east to west. Uh, we have just a, a huge shift in rain-fed cropping systems to drylands to supplemental irrigation to those which require full irrigation, livestock, tree crops, fruits, vegetables. And as a result, um, we were a natural fit for this laboratory as well. And then the fourth lab is looking at what we can do to reduce post-harvest losses. And so this is through really a two-pronged approach, one looking at how we can reduce storage losses and look at ways we can adapt systems in you know, low-income countries where there's not a lot of resources in order to store crops, and yet you get a lot of damage. And so I love this example that they showed in, in Central America where there's a picture of a, the group there, and you see in the front porch all these corn ears are hanging from the rafters, drying out, and right behind them is this big, huge metal uh, silo, and it's kind of a paradox. Why are they hanging their ears up there? Well, they have the silo behind them, and it's just because it's just it's too expensive for them to operate. And so it's looking at, one, reducing those post-harvest losses through better management of and storage, as well as trying to reduce any toxins that can accumulate during, you know, putting wet crops into storage. So we're talking about the things, mycotoxins and and other aflatoxins, which can, can accumulate on grains and make them unfit for human consumption. And, and this is really an insidious issue because you're you're in a situation where there's limited food available to begin with, and then once all of, all of a sudden it becomes infested with a mycotoxin, and then it's the only food available, but it's really poor quality, and it can cause damage to your liver, to your health. Uh, it's just a terrible problem. And so some of the research is showing that there's just a very high percentage of women who are pregnant in nations like Nepal that are finding these mycotoxins in their bloodstream. So the key is to clean up that food uh, source as well and store it so that it can be more nutritious for populations. So these labs connecting across many of the topics that were reported on in the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, that annual report that recently came out, and tying these ideas together of K-State's role and what they're doing to improve this picture of food insecurity and also the trends that are going on in the world. Do you see the focus of any of the labs shifting with this report, or do you think they'll keep moving forward um, working towards the goals that have already been set? Well, I think that that's a really good question, and, and that's under debate right now at USAID. So they're right now entering in the next phase of the Feed the Future research strategy. It was just unveiled a few months ago in, in September. And it's always what's going on in this state of food insecurity is always feeding into this debate. Are we using our resources in the best manner possible to attack some of these problems? And so I anticipate that in the next uh, couple of years that certainly the priorities in USAID will change. Some will remain the same, but others will change as we are updating uh, and learning more about what some of the, the issues are in the world. Well, thank you for coming on and sharing with us today, Tim. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. It's great to be here. That once again was K-State Agricultural Economist and Director for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Collaborative Research on Sorghum and Millet, Tim Dalton, joining us to talk about a gamut of issues surrounding food security, and this being a timely issue as the 2017 State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report was released just a couple weeks ago. I'm Sarah Moyer, and stay tuned here on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
This Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson here. It is day two of the 2017 National FFA Convention taking place in Indianapolis. And once more, there are a number of things going on involving Kansas FFA members. With a recap of what happened yesterday at convention and a look ahead to what's on the slate for today, we have once again the state FFA reporter for Kansas, Riley Schlichter. Riley, you're coming off of a very busy day one, you say. Let's talk first of all about what was happening on the floor business-wise. Anything of note there? Yeah, yesterday was kind of a big day for uh, all of the delegates here for Kansas as Yesterday, all of the delegate committees finalized their committee reports, and this morning those committee reports will be brought up um, on the entire delegate floor for approval. Now, we touched upon several of the items discussed in those committees when we talked yesterday. So Correct. Th- this will be a very active day with respect to getting things done, it would sound. Yes, looking to finalize everything and make any finishing touches for our, our final committee report. A number of Kansas FFA members have been involved the last 24 hours or so in career development events and the competitions associated with those. That is correct. We have some very exciting news to report from here in Indianapolis as uh, we had some great success yesterday in the career development event. Uh, One of those successes was with the Kansas representative for the extemporaneous public speaking event and that would be John Kennedy from the Jackson Heights FFA chapter, where we learned last night that this morning he will be moving on to the final round of four individuals who will be competing for the national title in extemporaneous public speaking. Yesterday, we also had Natalie Harris competing in the Employability Skills Contest, representing us from the Chapman FFA chapter. We also had the Clay Center FFA chapter participating in the Parliamentary Procedure Contest, which we'll be finding out the results here in the next few days. And we also have great news for our national officer candidate, as Tyler Langbart, once again our national officer candidate finalist, uh, went through a few more rounds of interviews yesterday and is looking to finish up his interviews today, and then we'll wait the rest of the week to find out how he does. So several FFA members have been getting things done in Indianapolis. Our congratulations to all as they push forward. In Tyler's case, as he vies for a national office, that's a a tremendous feather in his cap simply to get this far, Riley, to put it that way. Oh, there he is. Yes, sir. And also a a unique opportunity that we have today is Kansas's star finalist in the agribusiness section, Austin Nordyke, will be competing. And he will be going through uh, multiple rounds of interviews today. And Austin is representing us from the Hugoton FFA chapter. To note, for those who don't know, there are four finalists nationally for the star in agribusiness. So the competition is very keen here, isn't it? That is very correct. It's a very prestigious opportunity and honor for Austin to make it this far. So we're wishing the best as well to Austin Nordyke from the Hugoton chapter as he strives for the star in agribusiness recognition nationally. And so far, what's been your favorite part of convention activities as you've been involved as a delegate or otherwise, Riley? So far, one of my favorite experiences has been the opportunity to represent Kansas as a delegate on the committee floor. As I'm able to not only put in my own views, but I'm also able to Uh, represent our state and uh, have unique discussions with uh, other individuals from across the United States and really uh, work out some what we think will be influential changes to the future of the National FA organization. Excellent. When we talk again tomorrow this same time, we'll find out more about that business uh, that is going to be discussed on the floor today, as well as other achievements of Kansas FFA members as we move into the next day of the convention. Riley, the best to you today, and hang in there with the busy agenda. We appreciate your time right here. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Have a great day yourself. He's from the Abilene FFA chapter, and serving as the current state reporter for the Kansas FFA is Riley Schlichter. And joining us there via phone from the floor of the 2017 National FFA Convention, which continues today in Indianapolis. 
Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas Soybean Update with Greg Akagi. Greg? Lisa Zane, registered dietitian, joins us. And Lisa, you were involved in a partnership between the Kansas Soybean Commission and Kansas Pork Association called Real Pig Farming. What is that all about? This was such a great trip. Uh, We got to visit not just uh, pork farms, but also visit with farmers who produce soybeans and corn crops as well. We traveled registered dietitians along with online influencers such as food and travel bloggers and had the opportunity to bring a couple Kansas farmers along with us. And for that purpose, that's really who you're trying to target in this case as far as getting involved in this? Those who have an interest in communicating with the public about uh, farming practices, of which dietitians have special concern um, because we translate that agricultural information um, into the nutrition of food as well. Being able to go up to a farm, I'm sure, is a neat experience for those who are involved in this, too. Oh, my gosh. It was so eye-opening. Um, even as somebody um, you know whose grandparents had a farm, this was a completely more comprehensive perspective, and I learned a lot. As you go through this and, and getting that message, what were some of the things that the dietitians and the bloggers really looked at or, I guess, asked questions of to those farmers? As dietitians, especially those that work in a retail setting, we get a lot of questions about how the animals are treated, how the crops are treated as far as GMOs and antibiotics, and being able to have farmers answer answer those questions about the why and the how is of real interest uh, educationally from, from those two groups of people. You hear the term farm to table. Well, you see what's on the table, but I'm sure it was great to see what was on the farm. Absolutely. We see things as dietitians from a nutrition perspective, um, so we need to reverse that a little bit and see where it originated. And if people want more information or like to see some of the highlights, they can go to Twitter to use the hashtag Real Pig Farming. That's right. We've used it on social media a lot. And Instagram as well? Yes. You can get in touch with Kansas Soybean Connection that way, too. Lisa, I appreciate your time on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is Lisa Zane, who is a registered dietitian. She was part of the partnership between the Kansas Soybean Commission and Kansas Pork Association called Real Pig Farming. This has been the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. And we'll return shortly after this break. You're listening to Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Finishing up this Thursday edition of Agriculture Today, our weekly K-State horticulture segment. What we have for you is very appropriate for the weather conditions that are rolling in starting later tonight and continuing over the next couple of nights. Hard freezes expected throughout the better part of Kansas. For you vegetable gardeners, what does this say about salvaging your remaining produce out there still in the garden? Ward Upham is joining us once more. He's a horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension, with some thoughts toward that end. We now, because of the weather forecast, are likely going to pick very soon our last tomatoes of the season, Ward. They, they will not endure freeze at all, will they? They will not. They're one of our tender vegetables, as are peppers. And so when you harvest those tomatoes, you're going to find a lot of them are rotting. I mean, we have a disease that's a late-season disease called anthracnose. But if you find good ones, split them into three groups. Split them into those that are ripe those that are just starting to turn, and those that are still green. That way you can keep them separated because it's going to take a different amount of time for them to be ready to be used. All right. The ripe tomatoes obviously would be pretty much ready to go. Yes. Let's talk about those that are in between. That is to say they've started to turn, but they're not quite there. What should one do to maximize their use? So with all tomatoes, the way you store them is to try to get them as close to 55 degrees as you can. 
and that will allow them to ripen normally. If they have already started to turn, it won't help them at all to stay on that plant. Even if we didn't have a freeze coming, they can come off just because it's already been cut off from the plant. That stem has made that separation. It's still hanging there, but there's nothing going to or coming out of that fruit. So they're the ones that you're not going to lose any quality by picking them now. And you can just simply set them on the shelf indoors, let them ripen, and you'll be good to go there. That's right. Nothing else to do. Something, though, need be done differently with those tomatoes you say that aren't turning at all are still very much green, right? That's right. It's mainly just checking them to make sure that they are far enough long that they're going to go ahead and ripen. And so what you look for is on the bottom of that fruit, opposite the stem end, you'll notice a very faint white star. If you see that, they're good enough. You can allow them to go ahead and ripen inside. may not be quite as high a quality as what you get with what we call the breaker tomatoes, those that are already starting to turn, but a lot better than what you can usually get from greenhouse tomatoes. If that star isn't present, though, is that a salvageable tomato whatsoever? It's not. So if they have don't have that white star at all, it's probably better to just put them in a compost pile. Uh, they're not going to be ripe enough to ever make anything good out of them. But the key temperature for storing these tomatoes until they're usable is, what, 55 degrees? Yeah, 55 degrees you want to hold them for a while. You know, you can take them up to room temperature. That's not a problem at all. It's just that they're going to ripen a little bit quicker. Do these guidelines apply to those cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes that a number of gardeners still have out there? Yes. uh, So the same type of thing. You just look for the very same things. Uh, And usually they are a lot more disease resistant than our larger tomatoes. And so you can often get a, a very good harvest late in the season. But the point is, if freezing temperatures are in the forecast tonight, harvest those today. That's (laughs) right. Because otherwise, afterward won't work. That's right. I mean, you can still pick them. They'll take, even after the foliage of that plant is killed, if it's just a light frost, you can still harvest them. Just make sure that they're not getting mushy. If they're mushy, they froze, and therefore you wouldn't want to use any of those tomatoes. Let's talk peppers for a moment. Again, there are some of that produce still out there. Similar rules in as far as taking that last harvest of the season? Yes, they're even more sensitive to cold than the tomatoes are, so we need to get out there and get them harvested. However, they are a lot easier to take care of. In a sense, you can put them in a crisper in the refrigerator after you harvest them, and they'll last for several weeks. What most people like to do is Once they're harvested, they want to uh, freeze them so that they'll be able to use them through the winter. They're going to be mushy when you thaw them, but the flavor is still there. Mm -hmm. And so probably the best way to do that is to cut them up in small pieces, put them on a cookie tray and freeze them. And then you put them in your little storage bag and then put them in the freezer. Freeze them separately then before you store them away. That's right. So that when you're ready to use them, they're not in one big glob. That you can pour out what you need and put the rest back in the freezer. just works out a little bit easier. But the flavor does keep in a frozen state. That's right. That's right. And this works for hot peppers as well. It's not just, um, not just the regular peppers, bell peppers. Ward, you do have one important footnote in as far as storing peppers away. When one is handling those, they need to be, you say, handled with care. That's right. If you're talking about hot peppers... They have a product called capsaicin within them that can burn. And so make sure you wear gloves and make sure you don't rub your eye once you have started cutting them. So just be careful with them. They'll, they will act just like a, a regular bell pepper as far as storage is concerned. Because anyone who's done that will testify that that's a painful experience. <laughs> There are those other crops still in the ground, actually, the cool season crops, and one would think that they would endure a hard freeze a little more readily than these other crops, right? Yeah, there's some variability there. There are those that are what we call semi-hardy. They can take a light frost, but once you get into freezing temperatures, uh, usually you're talking mid to upper 20s, they're going to be okay, get below that, and they're going to be damaged. We're talking about things like beets and Chinese cabbage, collards, Irish potatoes, lettuce, mustard, radishes, all those types of plants. Now, the beets, when we say they'll be damaged, we're talking about the top part of the plant. The root's going to be fine, but the top part of the plant, uh, once you get down to mid to upper 20s, it may be damaged. There are others, though, that are even hardier, you say. That's right, and they will take temperatures down to the low 20s. That includes things like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, carrots, turnips, and kale. These are very hardy 
plants. And so they'll take down to the low 20s uh, before you're going to see much damage. Anything that is a root crop will endure for a while until the ground freezes? Yeah, so you're looking at probably late November to December uh, would be when you're going to have to dig them. You know, you're going to lose the tops. Once you get those cold temperatures, you lose the tops. But that which is in the ground it can stay for quite a while. Be sure to mulch them. Mm. That way that top of that root doesn't freeze. And when it gets cold enough that the ground's going to freeze, then you need to dig them. Once more, these cool-loving vegetables, they can endure this uh, hard freeze that's coming in. Warm-loving crops, tomatoes and peppers, by all means, bring in what is out there and make the most of the uh, end of the growing season for those crops. Ward, we appreciate the word on this, and it's a good heads up heading into this weekend. Thank you. You bet. He's Ward Upham, horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension. And that is this week's horticulture segment closing out this Thursday edition. We appreciate you being along with us. Please rejoin us here tomorrow, won't you? Until then, and for Sarah Moyer, Eric Atkinson here, this has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.